Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Today, my guest is Carline Postma. Carline is the founder of The Post, a content marketing agency in the Netherlands, and the author of Binge Marketing, the best scenario for building your brand. Carline, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So before we get into your book, Binge Marketing, which I've got right here on my desk, I just, I was telling Caroline before the episode, I just found out about this book a few weeks ago. And a friend of mine said, you got to read this book. It's really good. And I picked it up. I started reading it. I was like, this is really good. There's some great fundamental marketing stuff in here, especially in view of how Netflix messes with us and gets us to binge on their stuff. So we're going to dig into that. But first, Carline, tell us a little bit more about your background and growing up and how you got involved in marketing. And then what was the inspiration to write this book? Okay, it's a lot of questions uh, to start with, but <laughs> just a bit about myself. I, I am, uh, well, I'm from the Netherlands. I live in the Netherlands and grew up there. Um, and well, actually, I think since I was about eight years old, I always wanted to become a journalist. Um, and then right before I had to choose the, the well, the, the, the college where, um, well, it's, it's a different system here, but um, what I was going to become, <laughs> then um, I turned into advertising. So I, um, I went, well, I, I went to uh, an, an HBO, they call it here, it's higher education, um, and studied marketing. And that's, that's also what, uh, what I started in, uh, I think, the first six years of my um, my working life, um, I was in marketing, I was in advertising. So I always say I learned so much about uh, how things, uh, well, about working and about marketing and about uh, how business work works. Um, and then in 2006, that was, then I um, quit my job and started for myself because um, I thought there was more to do with internet and and the, the agency that I worked for, well, it's it was not in their business uh, plan. They lived from uh, creation and, of course, media, as uh, I think a lot of uh, agencies did. So, um, so I started for myself, and um, well, that's I, th I think that's also when uh, I kind of um, got, got more interest in in, in uh, social media and stuff and. Well, the first book, because the book that we're talking about today is the first book in English, and, but it's my fourth book that I wrote. And the first book was about Twitter in 2010. And that was uh, something, well, I think 2009 Twitter uh, got a little bigger in, in the Netherlands. It, uh, it, came, uh, it came around uh, at that time too. And I wrote the first book and it was kind of a bestseller in the Netherlands, but it was Dutch. <laughs> And yeah, well, that's that's. I think that's the beginning of when I thought, well, if you can write, um, you can spread the word, you can um, start conversation, you can learn things because you have to write it down and you have to check it. And I think it's it's where I just got a little bit back from my um, dream of becoming a journalist. As I always say, it's it's a bit a bit of both. When so, you wrote that first book on Twitter, did that help you with your business at all then? Yeah, certainly. Well, it, it was a bit um, uh, the other way around because I did not decide for myself to, to write that book on Twitter. Um, but in my agency, I was curious about what could Twitter do for businesses. So um, I started with workshops um, and Twitter is not very difficult, so <laughs> as you may, may be aware of. But um, uh, I started with uh, uh, well, training uh, organizations uh, to how to use Twitter and how to educate the, the employees. And then all of a sudden a publisher came to me and asked if I could write it down. And um, yeah, it certainly helped because, well, the first, um, I, I think the first couple of months after uh, the book was uh, published, was launched, I was in a lot of, um, uh, um, media, uh, well, um, there was a lot of media about it. And um, also I got more training uh, to do. Yeah, because you're probably the only person who had written a book on Twitter in Dutch, I'm guessing <laughs> at that point. 
Yeah, the first at least. <laughs> yeah. Not, not so then, the only one afterwards. But <laughs> so then what was your second book after that? Yeah, well, the second book was um, <laughs> was about personal branding, but I have to say a timing was uh, was an issue there because the book uh, launched, I think, seven days after I gave birth to my second daughter. And <laughs> I remember I got a call from a radio station. You had your station. hands full. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, it, my mind full, I think, <laughs> because I had a call from a radio station if I could come over and discuss the book. And I just said no. And that's just a tip. Never say no to <laughs> whatever it is. Never say no, because one, if, if you have one, um, uh, uh, how do you call that? If, you, if you're in one, one of the, the, the newspapers or in a podcast or then the rest will follow. So yeah. if you quit the first one, I don't think people will call you again. <laughs> so you missed so your opportunity. Was, so you, uh, yeah, yeah. So you can, uh, was... you can blame your daughter forever. You can say you messed up my PR <laughs> opportunity, but it was yeah, worth it. a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> and so then yeah. you had another book. So was yeah. Binge Marketing your fourth book or you had yeah, four books fourth before? Book. Fourth book. So then what was book number yeah. three? The book number three was Content Marketing in 60 Minutes. Um, so I already, um, uh, well, uh, repositioned my, uh, my agency for interactive communication into uh, an agency for content marketing, because I think that's where everything comes together with... Um, whatever social network, whatever channel you use, it's about the stories. It's about whatever you want to share. And afterwards, well, just pick your uh, channel to, to spread the word. Um, but this, this is just um, in a nutshell. But um, content marketing in 60 minutes, 60 minutes <laughs> was uh, um, in 2014. And that was, it was a good book. It was, uh, I think it was the start of the methodology that I described in, uh, in Binge Marketing, which is my fourth book indeed. Um, but I did not uh, uh, um, look at Netflix at that time yet. It was more like become a publisher as a content market, well, as, as a brand. And the fourth book, what, what well, what um, uh, that was translated. And that's also the reason that I think that we are discussing this book right now. Um, is binge marketing and that is is, is about um, if you want to share your story as a brand and try to translate your brand story into the scenario of a great television series and that's the um, the link with Netflix the well there are so many learnings uh, from the creators of series and, and films and that well it was time to write that down yeah mm -hmm. is Netflix big in the Netherlands Yes, it's a number one streaming service. I don't know uh, how many, but uh, a lot. Before I uh, moved to Massachusetts, I lived in China and Netflix is illegal in China. They don't have it, it's blocked. Oh. And so yeah. I kind of, uh, I was living in Asia for most of the past six to eight years. And uh, so I w wasn't really familiar with usage patterns on Netflix until I came back to the US. And then it was like, wow, like everybody is using Netflix, but I still wasn't sure if it was more of a US centric thing or a global thing. And it seems like it's a global thing everywhere except China. So yeah, yeah that's, that's with multiple things. But when did you, when did you return to, uh, to the States? Uh, about two years oh, ago. Two years ago. Okay. Yeah. Then, then I think Netflix was already global yeah. except for <laughs> China. Yeah, except then, for yeah. China. <laughs> so with binge marketing, then did you say that you wrote it in Dutch first? Yeah. Yeah. And you published yeah. it in Dutch first. Was did the Dutch version come out? When did that come out versus the English version? The Dutch version was, um, I think, exactly one year before, October two thousand and nineteen. Okay. But um, but I, I think, and and that's something that that occurred to me. Well, in in the past couple of years, I think, and there's only. 23 million people who speak Dutch <laughs> mm -hmm. and how many of those are marketers <laughs> right. can't be it's, it's a, such a small number um so I I thought if I want to share this this approach um well more widely then uh, then it has to be translated so I looked for an, uh, a publisher who saw something in the book and I found it and then it took a lot of time uh, I don't know why, but, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it, it, it took a year. Yeah. Okay. And then it was just released in early 2021 recently, right? 
in English? Um, yeah, it was released in English in uh, but at the end of 2020, but um, uh, due to uh, COVID, it, it got delayed um, uh, for launch in, in the US. I think it was in, in, in the end of January that Amazon picked it up on uh, for the US. Okay, got it. So give us some more insight into why you wrote this book. What was the inspiration? Why did you feel like this is a really important book that need and this story needs to be told or these ideas need to be shared? Yeah, well, at my content marketing agency, uh, uh, the Post, um, which I founded, but I uh, I, I sold the company, uh, by the way, uh, last year. So I could work a little bit more or actually a lot more <laughs> on, uh, on, on getting binge marketing out there. Um, but in my uh, in my work as a as a, a marketer, um, I always got the same questions, and it's it's something that I was looking for um, an, a solution for brands to um, well to to actually to to get an audience and to retain that audience, and I think it was it, it's at the beginning of, of my book as well, but it was at one evening that I was. Well, there's, there's so many a time that I was arguing with my daughters to um, that they had to go to bed after we watched an episode of Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time is, is a series that um, is streamed on Netflix, but they never just stood up and went <laughs> upstairs because every episode ends with a cliffhanger. And um, so they kept on watching and, and I do the same. And I think every listener who watches series does the same thing. You just keep on binging, you keep, keep on um, uh, consuming these episodes because it never ends. And that's when it occurred to me that I thought, this is exactly what we should do in marketing. We should, um, we should look at the creators of, of films and series. What, what they do is content marketing. They know exactly how to tell a compelling story and, and also how to engage an audience and uh, to find it and to to retain it and that's that's the same problem or actually the struggle that we have as marketers trying to get our story across in in the most um, uh, efficient but also a brand worthy way and build an audience uh, at the same time so that's what that's when I uh, started looking into um, well I think it, it's it's the the things that people who write series already know. Um, it's, it's, it's something that it's just, it's just there. If you write a story, if you write a series, never finish your episode. You always have a quick um, flash forward to the next episode. So people just keep on uh, watching. And, and what we do in marketing is we, we just write stories that's, that have a start and an end. <laughs> they all end. But why, why do we do that? Why, if, if we want to try to, to build an audience, why do we stop with our stories? Why don't we just follow the, seri the creators of series and just create a series and create episodes and keep on, let, let people keep on watching? That's the way you, you can build an audience. And with only one episode that has a start, a middle and an end, you won't build an audience. Yeah. Now I've noticed I really got clued into this when the Marvel movies started coming out and I started watching the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Yeah. And at the end of every one of these movies, I thought, no, oh, I can't believe this is over. Like, I mean, they would have some sort of huge cliffhanger at the end of the movie. And then <laughs> they give you these previews during the credits and it makes it, you're so excited for the next movie in that series to come out. And I mean, I don't know if there's any other major motion picture series that has this many episodes in it. I mean, they're up to like 30 movies or something. And it's just crazy yep. that they can just keep this going. And it's like a money printing machine for them. I mean, every time they put out a movie, we've got a near billion dollar movie every single time they release yeah. one. And now it's not only the movies anymore. They also have the series like uh, WandaVision and uh, well, the, the Winter Soldier. What was it? Captain? No. Um, sorry. The, yeah, it's the, the Winter Captain Soldier America, one. They the have Winter all these breakups and, the and then they have like the yeah. <laughs> one where they go back and they look at uh, S.H.I.E.L.D., Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and all this. It's Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's also something I, um, uh, I, I 
refer to in my book because the Marvel Cinematic Universe, what you just um, uh, said, um, that's, that's brilliantly thought of because they have an audience for, for example, Iron Man. And then in that same uh, um, arena, in the, in the same decor, they have Thor, they have, um, well, Spider-Man a little bit, <laughs> and they have all these characters. And I compare it to, if you have a multi-brand strategy, people are just creating new stories, new campaigns for every brand. But if they, what if, what if you could create your own Marvel Cinematic Universe? So one domain where all those brands have their own stories, but also you can make the crossovers. So you don't have to start building new audiences for every brand that you're going to uh, to launch. So it, it's it's all those smart things that they use in these these creators of content because that, that's is what they do best. Um, I think there are so many things that we can learn from them in marketing, and it surprises me that well I haven't seen or read about it a lot before. So. <laughs> I think it's it's really easy to to look at those things and and well add them to your own uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. So when you were writing your book, were you thinking how do I use what I'm teaching as I'm writing my book and as I'm putting the chapters together? Was that something going through your mind? Um, yeah, you mean if you, to binge the chapters? It, right, to actually get was, people yeah. binge reading your book and getting through it all the way to the end and then wanting more. Yeah, and at the same time, the process of writing, uh, well, maybe you uh, you recognize it, is just getting the stuff on your paper, on paper. So <laughs> it's, it's of course, you try to do that, but it, that, I, think that's, I think that it's what I did the second time I read it. Because at first, I, I, you just have to get it out of there, get it out of your head and get it on paper and try to make it sound logical and um, and afterwards I try to get that red thread I think you call it throughout all the uh, the chapters and of course it ends with um, no end <laughs> yeah exactly so where how far does this go back this idea of tying things together like this I mean can you think of, I mean, what's the first example of marketing or media that you can look back on and say, hey, they were clued into this even way back then. Is there old, are there old TV shows? Does it, does it even predate TV that you can look back and say, hey, they were using binge marketing 300 years ago or something in this society? Yeah, I think the, but the usage of, uh, um, a cliffhanger. I wrote it down in my book. I don't know what year it was, but it's, it's like a a, um, a, um, a story, like a fairy tale that um, a woman was. Uh, oh wow, this is very hard to explain in English. <laughs> um, she was sentenced to death. To death, yes. And um, but she kept on telling a story every night, and she didn't finish it. So she kept on um, pushing the. Um, the death date, she postponed it every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is like the first example in, a, I think it was a book series or something um, of, of using this cliffhanger idea. But I think um, writers of, of novels, of, of, of um, books al already use it a lot because there are so many books that you can't stop reading, but that's usually, it's fiction. But we also should do that with nonfiction and um, well, in marketing as well. So I don't know if it's, um, it, well, let's say it's not new. It's only um, the idea of adding it to marketing um, on the, on the, on the, um, while knowing it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that is, that is something we, we should do a lot more. Yeah. So one of the challenges I've run into with this concept is it's, like with a book or a TV show where you're, it's very structured, it's scripted, you're writing it out, you can edit it. Like you said, with the book, you get your ideas out first and then you can go back and you can figure out, okay, what should I have for cliffhangers or how do I leave an open yeah. loop at the end of a chapter so that people have to go to the next chapter to close that loop. But there are other mediums where this is a little bit tricky to do. For example, podcasting, 
I don't know who my next guest is going to be yet. And Mm -hmm. so, or if I'm doing something live on TV or on radio or something, how do you create that open loop that people feel like, oh, I've got to close this when you don't necessarily know what's coming next? Yeah, I think we don't have to um, uh, use only the same type of content. So a podcast refers to a pod, to the next podcast and the next podcast, and um, and that that's not necessary. Um, it's not necessary in binge marketing. You can also have this uh, podcast and then refer to an interview uh, in in writing, for example, next uh, next week, or maybe because. I think the idea of binging is that, you know, there are multiple episodes. You can also refer back to uh, previous episodes, but also um, uh, the other way around, if you have this episode, um, then you have to uh, cut it into pieces uh, and share it across all the, the, the social media, for example, that you have. So I think it's, it's, you don't have to binge, um, every episode in a chronological way. You can binge all the way around, for example. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I also think it's not necessary to get them all, uh, get all the ep- episodes uh, out there at the same time, because people can, uh, you don't know when your audience is going to uh, listen to it or watch it. And I think for podcasts, it's the same thing. Now you don't know who your next uh, guest is, but maybe in two weeks you do know. And if people, if you see in your data that people are still uh, listening to this podcast, you can also put an add on to it and then refer to um, something that um, is relevant for your audience in the podcast that you're going to record in two weeks, for example. Mm -hmm. Very true. So other than Netflix and Marvel, who are some of the companies that are out there that are doing a really good job at this? Yeah, that's a hard question because um, uh, in, I have some examples in my book in the Netherlands because that's, well, where I live and I consume the, uh, the examples there, of course. But what I saw um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I was very interested by it, I, I didn't get the um, more details, unfortunately. But Headspace, I don't know if you know, Headspace is a mindfulness app. Yeah. And they have yeah. their series on Netflix right now. And I think that's that's brilliantly thought of because people are consuming it on Netflix. And it's, it's well, it's, it's um, I think it, it can only work for the app to, to be downloaded so many times um, because the series on Netflix, I don't like the series on Netflix, by the way, it's, it's quality thing is, is, is it, well, it can be different maybe. But um, I think a lot of uh, uh, companies that started in the last couple of years are thinking this way. A lot of, uh, well, the mindfulness apps, of course, but also the, the influencers on, on uh, um, uh, workouts and stuff. They all, all do the same, the same thing. Mm-hmm. And as authors, those listening to this podcast, trying to get tips on how to be a better author, how to write a better book, write a book that people are really going to be interested in. What are some of the other tips that they can take away other than having a cliffhanger at the end of a chapter or something like that? What are some of the other ways that authors can implement the things that you've learned about binge marketing to craft their book and make that book spread further and wider and faster? Yeah, I think if if I compare the story you're about to write in your book, if you compare that to uh, the scenario of a great television series, then you start with the back flap. <laughs> and it, maybe it's it's also what you started already, but what if you can can um, uh, tell us in, in one paragraph what your story is about, what your book is about, then you have your plot summary, as I call it. What is it about? Uh, what can we expect? Um, maybe who is telling it? Are you telling it? Uh, is, is it filled with testimonials, for example, with, with cli- client cases? Or um, Those are the things you have to think about up, up front. And I think that's, that's already written in my book. Four things. Um, who, is, who is the one telling your story? Um, but also, what themes can we describe? Can, can we, well, distract from it actually? 
um, where does it play? And that's, that's more like the arena, maybe uh, the, the example I, that I just gave about uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that's the domain uh, on uh, um, where, where those brands like Thor, like Iron Man uh, have their part. So what are we talking about in your book? What is your arena? And, and maybe a genre, is it educational? Um, I think there are a lot of books are educational. Maybe it can be fiction, maybe it can be uh, documentary humor is some things you can um, think of up front and uh, the next thing if you have that plot summary like the back flap of your um, your your book you also have to think about who your audience is and I use the audience journey for it and the audience journey gives you insights on what is relevant to your audience at what moment um, in his journey and it's, it's kind of a, um, a technical thing to explain in the podcast, but it's, it gives you an idea of um, what, uh, what makes your audience move. And if you know what, your, what, makes your, audi what your audience moves, <laughs> then you know that you have to write your episodes on it. And maybe your episodes can be compared to chapters in your book. So, uh, and, and I didn't think of this before, but I think... Uh, it's a good uh, example yeah. to use this book um, as um, as also um, uh, a, a template to write your episodes, to, to write your chapters. Mm -hmm. So do you think about, uh, I mean, you have a book, you're trying to market your book, you're trying to get the word out there. How do you use these principles with your platform, with your website, with your social media, with any PR speaking that you're doing? How do you use what you're an expert at in those areas to drive more interest in your book and get people to read it? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I, I did... Um... I created a, an, uh, an online course for it. And in my online course, I also have the examples of what I use myself to uh, attract um, uh, audiences to, for example, my website. And what I do is I, um, I try to get experts from this other industry, like the experts in, in film uh, making and, and the creators of series. And I just ask them everything there is to know. <laughs> So I, uh, for example, I interviewed uh, Martin Kolhoven. He's a film director uh, from the Netherlands. Um, it, uh, the podcast is in English, by the way. But um, uh, one of the things that he added to my idea of, uh, of, of um, uh, binge marketing is um, how do you create a second season, for example? Can everything have a second season? Can every, can every book author have a second book or a third book and is it like in the same series or and that's th those questions I still get to ask so the book writing was something I did when I uh, work with clients and now I try to get the experts uh, to add more knowledge more um, well everything I did not write down yet and I ask them everything and then I try to um to have that, like the, the, the expert in marketing to um, uh, check it. Can they use it this way or can't they? And that's, that's my idea of what I'm trying to create now in, in blogs and articles and podcasts that I'm still trying to make. Yeah, so you're creating all this additional content that's re related to your book, but it all ties back to the book and then it makes people feel like, well, okay, to really get this, I need to go read the book to understand fully what she's talking about in this blog post or social media post. Yeah, and it's also a challenge for myself of course, because once you've written the book and you think, well, this, the subject is finished, but I think it's never finished because once it's published, it's there. there are new things that you find out or you just have new examples. So just keep on building upon this idea of binge marketing. And it's what I'm trying to do indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with the book, I'm curious to get into the technical aspects of actually producing this book. And it's interesting as a case study, because like you said, you wrote this in Dutch first, and then you had it translated into English. So did 
So you said you hired a translator, is that right? Or did your publisher yeah. hire a translator? No, I hired a translator because I had to, um, um, I had to uh, give them the translated manuscript and then they did the, the editing. Okay, got it. And so you worked with a publisher, LID Publishing, it looks like. So did yeah. they, were they, did they specialize in like US distribution or English language distribution or why did you choose this publisher? Um, yeah, well, they, I, I, I didn't really choose. I, um, I wrote through my a Dutch publisher. I asked if they knew uh, a publisher uh, for, for the English market. And um, there were a lot of uh, big publishers that were not interested because they do a lot of the, the, the well, like this, these kind of books, the, the bigger books <laughs> uh, with like thousand pages uh, for colleges, for universities and, uh, and so on. And this is more a practical book. Uh, it's a marketing book, of course. Um, and this was actually the first, um, I think it's also the third that they wrote um, and this they they saw something in it to try to to get it translated and um, and, and published mm -hmm. it, it was, was just a, an excerpt they, they just got an excerpt of the book and based on that they um, said well we would like to do that and that's when I uh, had it translated for it. the all the pages yeah so you already knew they were going to publish it when you got it translated. Yeah, yeah. Got it. And uh, what was the editing process like uh, doing editing in, in a second language that isn't your first language? <laughs> was that challenging or uh, what was that I like? I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot of new words. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that, that's, that's quite hard. I can only imagine because I, I lived in Brazil for a while. I speak Portuguese somewhat okay. fluently. But when I sit down to write in Portuguese, oh, it is so hard to do. I mean, I can speak it just fine, but if I okay. go to sit down and write it, it's a whole different ball game for me. Oh, I, I think it's the other way around with me. It's, um, I do, well, I, I do uh, speak a lot more in English now, but um, uh, with writing, I think writing, it, it, it gives me time. And of course, uh, English is, is our second language here in, uh, in the Netherlands in, in all, almost all over Europe. So, um, but it's, it's just it's so many words that I didn't, uh, rec well, I did recognize them, of course, but I didn't know that that was the word for it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. There's so many nuances with language and with words, and we take it for granted when we speak or write in our own language. But as soon as yeah. we translate it, it's like, well, wait, is this exactly the right word to use here? Or should I use this yeah. other one? And it can really get tricky and a little bit it, uh... Yeah, and that's that's also why I, it's it's not a, a matter of only of translation. It's it's translating and copywriting at the same time, because yeah. of course in in Dutch I can um, I, I can find like like ten different ways to say something, but in English I have one maybe two, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and that's why you really need someone that understands copywriting. Mm -hmm. So what are your hopes for this book? You said you sold the post, so you're no longer run, running your agency. So it sounds like you're full-time talking about binge marketing and doing speaking, I assume. I assume. What else are you trying to build with this book and the future in your career? Yeah, well, um, I, I, of course, I still um, uh, do things with the post because yeah well um i started the binge marketing. they're the only the only agency that uses binge marketing for real with brands so um i i i'd like to be part of that um but uh the second thing is um i'm working on uh just professionalizing content marketing um on a on a larger scale um and binge marketing i've got this angle of binge marketing and of course I, I look at every example um, through the eyes of, of is, could, could it be serialized? Um, is this building an audience? Um, what, what else can they do? And I call it binge marketing, but it, well, the profession is of course the, content, the field of content marketing. And that's where I try to, um, to coach and to train people. I do my own courses, of course, uh, with, um, with the binge marketing angle. And 
um, well, we already talked about language uh, and, and language is something that um, in Europe we've got 24 different languages, but also 24, well, 27 uh, um, countries in the EU as a member of the EU. But how come that we don't get access to cases from Germany, for example, of access to cases from France or Romania, Poland, you can name every country, but if uh, brands and uh, professionals are writing in their own language for their own audiences, then we don't get to see it. But I, I think there is a lot to learn there. Um, and that's what I uh, do as a second um, uh, thing. Um, and that's what also why I'm in Munich right now to interview someone from a German uh, company with a German case. Um, to get it translated, to, to have the, the, the um, well, I, I call it, I'm trying to unlock content marketing in Europe because of all those different languages. We only get um, access to examples in, uh, in the UK and uh, in the States, of course, but the rest, Danish, uh, for example, Danish cases are written in Danish, but they're just as brilliant and just as um, uh, interesting for uh, for the Dutch or for the Germans as well. So I'm trying to connect those things. That's great. Are you already working on a next book? Um, no, <laughs> actually, no. But I think it's, uh, I, I never really start working on a book. I'm just doing the things. It, it, it's also, I started, my first book was in 2010, then 2011, 14, 19, 20. <laughs> And I think it's the experience while I'm working um, that makes me think about new books, new things to write. But I think this is not this is not ready yet. I, the the methodology is is in this book, mm -hmm. and now I'm trying to get more information, more uh, ideas, more people in in script script writing and film writing, for example, to share their ideas with me. Got that's, it. that's the first thing. So you're collecting lots of information and at some point you'll have a bunch of stuff and you'll say, Hey, I could turn this into a book. Exactly. That's how it works most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Caroline, thanks so much for being with us here today on the published author podcast. If people want to reach out and connect with you, where's the best place for them to find you? Um, I think you can best start with, um, at my website, carlinepostma.com. It's also bingemarketing.eu. You get the, you get to the same page, <laughs> and you can start with the with the with the book, of course, to read the book. I think it explains a lot. Um, and I've created a course if you want to really work with the the methodology. You can follow this course, and you can also find that one on uh, carlinepostma.com. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for being with us here today on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit publishedauthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources. 